Hello and welcome. I'm Pater Nuez Makel. This is Rappler Talk. We're now with Councillor Christy Kenny of the U.S. State Department. She's a very familiar face here in the Philippines. She was the U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines from 2006 to 2010, and she is now in Manila for a short visit. Thank you very much for joining us, Councillor Kenny. Great to see you again, Paterno, and thanks to Rappler for making time for me. Thank you very much. And we Filipinos know you best as a U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines. Can you tell us briefly about your new role as Councillor of the State Department? Thank you. As Councillor, first of all, it's great to be back. Yeah. It's really, the Philippines is such a special place for me. I'm actually here in my role as counselor, which is one of our senior officials at the State Department. In fact, I'm a, our most senior female. And one of the things I do is take on special diplomatic missions on behalf of the Secretary of State. He asked me to come out here to get to know, start the conversation with the new Filipino government. Because obviously, you know, we're longtime friends of the Philippines. You've just had a historic election. And so his goal was for me to come out here and start talking to some of the foreign policy team, get to know them, and then Secretary Kerry himself is hoping to come out here very soon as well. Are there particular personalities that you are meeting? Uh... I've already met with the Secretary of National Defense, Secretary Lorenzana, and then I've met also with the National Security Advisor, General Esperon, and then I will see the Executive Secretary and, of course, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs. So what um, message from Secretary uh, Kerry would you want to bring to the new um, Duterte administration? It's an easy one. We're friends. We're ready to work together. Congratulations on the election. Again, we've got a long partnership, a long friendship. And every time there's an election in either one of our countries, you have to get to know the new officials and really start the partnership with some new faces but it's a continuation of a great partnership. We saw your photo with the uh, Defense Secretary last night, and exactly. uh, you met with two other people, right? Yeah, the Secretary of National Defense brought some of his staff, his undersecretary, and another, who again are old friends, so it was fun to see them again. Ambassador Goldberg kindly hosted us all for a very casual, friendly, relaxed How dinner. How was that meeting? That's it was fantastic. It was a relaxed dinner. Again, these are friends, people I've known a long time. Well, what we really talked about is, you know, where do we want to work together? What some of their priorities? I'm here, frankly, as much to listen as mm -hmm. to talk. You know, hear what a new team here is thinking. It's important to us that the Philippines be successful, that a new president and his team be successful, that the Philippines continue to move forward. So obviously we want to know where we can best fit in, how we can best support that effort. So based on what you've listened to last night, um, what are your initial thoughts of the Duterte administration? Very early to tell that because I've only met a few <laughs> officials. But clearly these are people, you know, we recognize a big election, you know, historic number of voters, and that citizens, you know, are, are eager to see progress on a whole range of fronts. Mm -hmm. You know, everything from economic growth to better traffic. Yeah. That's a global thing, of course. As you know, every city in the world wants their traffic to be better. But also... You know, we heard a lot of talk about our continuing partnership, for example, with the Armed Forces of the Philippines, our exercises, the modernization. So, you know, there are so many areas, as you know, we work on with the Philippines, and it's clear to me that's going to continue. And uh, tomorrow, or on July 12, the Tribunal in The Hague is set to release its ruling on the South China Sea dispute. Um, what is the stance of the United States on the upcoming ruling? It is a a big day scheduled for release. Uh, you know, our view is this is a complicated issue. There are six different countries with overlapping claims. You know, that's difficult, difficult to solve. We don't take a position on the individual claims, but our very strong view is that when this ruling comes out, it should be respected by the parties and that all the parties involved should use restraint, use this as an opportunity to dialogue, to move forward, you know, not as an opportunity to have provocative moves or anything that would raise the tension. But of course, China is saying that the U.S. should uh, uh, keep itself uh, out of this uh, dispute. This is a, an issue between two countries. Um, how does the U.S. respond to this uh, statement? We don't take a position on the claims, on whose claim is right or wrong. There are, as I said, six nations. You know, difficult to sort that out. But we've talked a lot to China as well. Secretary Kerry spoke to the Chinese foreign minister just a day or so ago. Mm -hmm. 
and again to tell him we hope that this ruling will be a basis for a peaceful diplomatic solution. I mean, Secretary Kerry talks to his Chinese counterpart often. Yeah. They're an important partner and, and an important global partner for all of us. Secretary Kerry also talked to the Philippine Secretary of Foreign Affairs as well, again, to introduce himself to his new counterpart, but to also talk about the importance of the respect for this ruling, but also using it as a good beginning for obviously a broader diplomatic conversation with the claimants. How important is it for countries like the U.S. and um, other countries in the world to um, recognize this upcoming ruling as binding, uh, something that has to be respected? You know, I think what's important for all of us, this ruling will be reviewed by lawyers, of course, around the world, and I'm sure that will be a complicated legal review. But I think what's important to all of us is to look at this as the kind of way you can solve complicated issues without resorting to violence. You know, this South China Sea is an important area for international commerce, transport, resources, an important area that needs to be environmentally protected. And so these six countries and the others who you know, enjoy the freedom of navigation through there. You know, this, this needs to be solved peacefully. And so I think as we see this ruling as part of a process that hopefully leads to a negotiated solution among the various claimants in whatever ways they think best to negotiate it, we, that's mm -hmm. for the claimants. But uh, China says the uh, tribunal has no jurisdiction over the case and um, the ruling should not be um, recognized and in fact it is uh, Drum, drumming up support for its position. Uh, the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative has a uh, tracker of uh, countries supporting the Philippines and, uh, the, or the ruling and the, the Chinese position on the ruling. How would you respond to this uh, claim that uh, the, the tribunal actually has no jurisdiction over the case? I let China speak for themselves, but the tribunal obviously reviewed very carefully the case before determining, you know, what aspects they didn't didn't have jurisdiction over. So I think that legally speaks to itself. The Duterte administration, um, well, President Duterte said he will not flaunt the the ruling if the Philippines uh, wins. So just in case the Philippines uh, decides to downplay or set aside the ruling, will the U.S. continue to to support or to stand by the? the ruling of the arbitral tribunal? Well, the ruling of the ar ar arbitral tribunal will speak for itself. And obviously the Philippines will make their decisions, the government, as to how they'll respond. But again, the thought that you would not flaunt it, as the president said, that you would issue restraint, use it as a basis for moving forward, that seems like a very good solution. But uh, why do you consider it a good solution, not to flaunt it? Um, because again, our view would be that you want to, the goal here is a diplomatic solution to a very complicated problem. The goal is not to use violence, to be provocative. And so to accept the ruling in a very peaceful way that opens the door for dialogue among the claimant states is I think the goal. So when we say flaunt, what do you, what do you mean when, when you say it's good to, not to flaunt it. Well, you know, again, I wouldn't use President Duterte's words, those are his <laughs> words, but it's good that in issuing any statement or comment on the ruling, it be a statement that's restrained, that again leads to dialogue that doesn't raise tensions. Just to move uh, to another topic, um, ISIS, how do you think should the region move, uh, move forward in addressing this issue? You know, ISIS is a global threat, and, and I wish it weren't the case, but we've seen attacks by them around the world. And I think one of the things we've learned from this, from these international networks of people who would do harm to all of us, is the need to work together. This is not something one nation can do alone. We need to share information, share best practices, work to counter violent extremism, mm -hmm. And the Philippines is already doing that with us and other partners. And I think we need to continue that. Again, these are people who are not interested in building economies. 
They're not interested in education. They're not interested in international peace. These are people interested in destroying. And I don't think any of us want to see our partner nations a victim. And so we want to work together, look for ways to share that information, keep our citizens safe, work together to prevent these groups from radicalizing young people. And social media plays a big role in radicalizing young people. How do you think um, can social media be tapped to uh, address the issue of ISIS? You know, it's interesting because you and I are big social media fans. Obviously, Rappler is a pioneer in social media, but there is a, a dark side to social media. I think of it as ways to talk to people, to make friends, to learn. But I think that's precisely what we need to keep doing. So even as these radical groups would use the internet to attract, we want to use the internet to offer other information and to counter that network of violent extremism. And I think we do that honestly in a transparent and open way by offering information, by letting young people know there are other options for them. In this country, you know, there are jobs, there are opportunities, there are things as the Philippines continues to grow. And so I think we want to use the internet precisely to offer alternative information. Is the U.S. State Department pioneering um, programs to use the internet to counter ISIS? We do have, and it's not just the United States. There are a number of countries around the world. Dubai also has a hub of an anti-violent extremist online center where people share ideas, how you reach these young people with a different message, with a more positive message. Um, you are one of the most uh, active diplomats on social media. How important is this for you as a career ambassador? You know, I started using social media for the same reason all my Philippine friends did, just to share information, keep in touch with friends across the miles. It's, uh, you know, one of those great ways our modern world lets us talk to friends or share sports mm -hmm. scores. One of your Rappler colleagues and I are always tweeting each other about yeah. tennis scores. We're both tennis fanatics. But, you know, for me as a diplomat, it also lets me hear from people I might not see in person. You know, people can tweet me things. I can learn about things. It lets me talk to them. I, I have friends, again, your colleague who does, you know, Twitter sports things, and I have never met, but we're friends because we share common interests. And as an ambassador, it's a great way of learning as well. You know, I use Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Instagram to learn about places. I use different platforms a little differently. Mm -hmm. My Instagram is fun pictures, but I love other people's pictures of where they've been, what they're up to. And you said no one handles your Twitter account for you. No one tweets for None you. None of my social media is handled by anyone but me. Never has been, never will be. But the VIPs always have uh, administrators. Why do you choose to handle it on your own? First of all, it's mine. <laughs> it's my communication with the world. I decide what I want to talk about, what I want to post. And as I said, I use different platforms for different things. So if I want to share a food picture on Instagram, it's what I'm eating and what I'm sharing. Mm -hmm. And it's important to me that it be authentic, that it be my own voice and not something someone else does. So it's mine. I maintain it on my personal devices, and that's the way it'll always be. Yeah, but diplomats are always viewed as uh, stiff, as uh, sometimes scripted. Oh. Um, why do you find it important to be authentic, to be who you are, to speak your mind, to handle your own Twitter account? Well, because it goes with my personality. I mean, we all do have personalities, and it's hard. No one should pretend to be something they aren't. But, uh, and particularly yeah. in communicating, if you want to commute, communicate who you are, what you're doing, or answer questions. Or as I said, sometimes I'm just lurking on social media, checking out what other people are up to, or checking news, or <laughs> weather, whatever. And in improving ties with uh, countries, how important is social media for diplomats like you? I found it to be terrific. Again, I hear from people, I learn about places that I might not get to in person. You know, as a U.S. ambassador, a U.S. official, you would love to say I'd have time to meet Filipinos in every part of the country, but I probably won't get to meet all the people I'd like to, but I can hear from them. I can hear from, I was recently on a trip for Secretary Kerry to Argentina and Uruguay. And so I got to talk to people in those two countries 
that again, I might not get a chance to meet in person, but how wonderful to hear from them and to keep hearing from them, what they're doing, where they are, follow some news in those parts of the world. I think it helps me learn a lot and grow a lot, but it's also just interesting. Do you see social media playing a big, bigger role in diplomacy in the future? I think it does play some roles. You know, Secretary Kerry uses social media. The new president of Argentina uses social media to communicate what they're doing, what they're thinking, where they are, adds an element of transparency, but I think also lets them emphasize things that are important to share some concepts, some thoughts that matter. So I think, you know, diplomacy is the business of building bridges to people, connecting to people, you know, using peaceful means to solve disputes, and I think information helps that. The more we know each other, the better we know each other, the easier it is for us to work together and to solve common problems. And I think social media is one way to do that. It's not the only way, as you and I know. It's nice to see friends in person. That's why it's great to be back here in the Philippines and catch up with you in person, not just <laughs> online. But it's also helpful. We can't always be everywhere we'd like to be, so the ability to stay in touch is terrific. Just one follow-up question on the sure. South China Sea, backtracking a bit. Um, um, one commentator, the uh, Singap Singaporean ambassador at large, said this issue is now beyond the South China Sea. Uh, it's an issue of uh, heeding or an international ruling of um, uh, respecting international law. It is now beyond the South China Sea. Do, do you share the same view? I, you know, I'm not familiar with those comments, but I, I don't think you want to make it any bigger than it needs to be. This is a complicated problem that you know, where you have six different nations claiming parts of the same space. You know, you don't want to make that problem bigger or harder. Again, to my mind and to the U.S. mind, it is all about looking for ways for peaceful solutions. Don't make the issue more difficult, harder to solve. It is already a complicated issue. Let's look for ways to work together, hope the claimant states can continue to find ways so that this space can continue to be a peaceful area where the Six Nations and all of the rest of us can coexist, can sail through, can work world's business through there without problems. So, Councillor Kenny, um, what message would you want to send to the ordinary Filipino? Many Filipinos miss you as a U.S. ambassador. Um, what message do you want to uh, send to them? Maybe you can greet them also in Filipino. If I would love <laughs> to. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. I know Filipinos are around the world. But, you know, it's wonderful to be back. The Philippines, for me, is like a second home. And, I, of course, I'm so happy when I hear a Filipino anywhere I travel in the world. You always bump into someone from the Philippines and your friends immediately. I think Filipinos have a special affinity for making people feel at home, that very friendly, open way. I miss it enormously, but I'm really grateful, again, to social media, to the opportunity to stay in touch with Filipino friends, even if I can't see them every day. So I want to thank you for staying in touch and Rappler for helping me stay posted on the Philippines and thank all of the Filipinos who've always made me feel like family. Thank you very much, Councillor Kenny. Thank we you. We were speaking with Councillor Kenny of the U.S. State Department. I'm Paterno S. Makel. Thank you for joining us.